So what can we do to screw this up? <laughs> we can uh, have too many toe. Too many toe, mm -hmm. too many salmon. Uh, too much competition with the smelt. We can overfish, we can underfish. Right. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. We're going to go catch some landlocked salmon today. Then we're going to put them to sleep. After we've caught our limit of salmon on Moosehead Lake, we're going to head off to a place that reportedly has the biggest brook trout in Maine. If you've ever been or never been to Nugent's Camps on Chamberlain Lake, you'll want to stay right here for that part of the show, too. It's all brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Napa Auto Parts, EBS, and Bar Harbor Whale Walk. The first part of today's show is just standing around. We're on Moosehead Lake, right at the boat landing in Greenville Junction. Tim Obrey is here, the chief fisheries biologist, and he's got a crew of three other inland fisheries and wildlife biologists with him. They're putting their boat in the water right now. Tim and I are standing on the shoreline. It's windy. The waves are lapping at our feet. We're facing into the wind and waves looking up the lake. Just a hundred yards off the shoreline, there are some small orange buoys, and that is why we are here. It turns out that salmon have a natural instinct to go home in the fall, wherever home is. Hatchery-raised fish were dumped into the lake from this spot in the last few years, and for whatever reason, they come back. That means we can net a few and see how they're doing. The biologist put out these nets two days ago. It's time to see what is in them. And this has turned out to be a minor event. About ten local folks have turned up to watch this. We're a small crowd standing around talking salmon. All right, we want to walk over here, Bob. You can see the net. Yep. Why don't we start by you telling me what are we doing and why? Okay, so this is an annual, an annual sampling event. We've done it every year since the 1970s, and we're specifically targeting Moosehead Lake salmon. Mm -hmm. And these are actually hatchery salmon. We stock right here at the boat launch every spring. And when the salmon become sexually mature, they home back to the spot where they were stocked. So it's a great chance for us to get our hands on, oh, we like to get between 50 and 100 salmon. And we look at the lengths, lengths and weights, and the age of the fish, and that's how we monitor the salmon growth in the lake. Okay. Where were they stocked from? Where were they raised? Uh, they're raised at the Emden Hatchery. Okay. So you can see there's there are three uh, orange buoys out there, and if you look real close, you can see some smaller brown buoys that go right oh, to yeah. shore. Mm -hmm. So that looks like that's well, we can walk right over there. But that's What's basically it looks like a tennis net, the so small net there. That go, that's a, called the lead. Yep. And it's about three feet tall, and it goes out to the box, which is the mouth in between um, these two orange buoys, and it has a, a fike in the in the mouth of that box. It's like a minnow trap or a lobster trap. And what happens is the fish are swimming along the shore here in the fall when the water temperatures are cool and they're looking for the stalking site and they bounce along that net and they can't get by it so they just keep following that <laughs> tennis lead till they get stuck into the box in the fight and then we come in every other day and uh, open up the, ba the box uh, the back end of the box and we take the fish out sort of like a herring weir yeah, yeah. So we're right off the beach in Greenville Junction, right by the boat right. launch, public landing. The salmon are swimming by here all the time, or are they just doing it when the weather gets colder? Uh, or what? You can catch, people fish here all summer long right off the, off the Junction Wharf and catch fish. But they come back, once the water temperatures start to cool in the fall, they home back here uh, more frequently. Mm -hmm. Do you know why they do it? Or is it just habit? It's just, it's just the homing instinct. We see it in trout and salmon. Is there right? Yeah. Yeah, we did some radio telemetry stuff on uh, radio telemetry work on brook trout in Saucadian Stream and the uh, Roach River, and we found that the, uh, the trout all come back to the same spot. No kidding. Year after year, yeah. During all these years, decades, in fact, of monitoring, are there some sites that are now different than they once were, and the salmon don't know what to do? You know, silted in reed, reeds um, or no? We don't really have that trouble here. Mm -hmm. um, so we stock, we stock at the Junction Wharf, we stock in Rockwood off the boat launch, and we stock in Lily Bay. And I would imagine if we trap netted any of those sites, we'd, we'd have fish coming back to them. Mm -hmm. And then the wild fish, most of those will go up into the Roach River or the East Outlet or the Moose River. Mm -hmm. 
when is spawning season for landlocks in? So they'll they'll move into the Roach River in September when we have yeah. flow, but they actually don't spawn until first second week of November. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of fish splashing in the nets out there. So you've been monitoring for years. What is it you're actually hoping to find out? I mean, that you can study the health of the population, I suppose, but you watching for increasing in numbers, increasing in size, disease? Um, mostly we're looking at uh, size and growth. The numbers will vary depending on how many fish we stock. So we're not really worried about, uh, can't really do like a population estimate like you can do in a trout pond if you're trying to catch all the fish. Mm -hmm. So we're just here, we're hoping to get a sample of, like I said, 50 to 100 fish maybe. And we look at the mean length by age and we compare that to years and then we know if we can, for example, if the fish start getting smaller that we may need to make some either regulatory adjustment or stocking adjustment to improve growth. Mm -hmm. If they're smaller, that's because there are too many fish? Too many fish, not yeah. enough food. That's a chronic problem we've had in Moosehead for <laughs> 20 years. We're just, we're really just starting to get ahead of it now. And the problem wasn't so much with too many salmon as it was there were too many uh, wild lake trail. Yeah, right. So that's why in 2008, we went to no size or bag limit on lake trail. We put the ice fishing derby into effect and we thinned those lake trout down. And now we're really seeing the best growth we've ever seen on Moosehead right now. Mm -hmm. So toad eat small salmon. Do s large salmon eat small salmon? It's not that they're eating the salmon, they eat. They all eat smelts. Uh, okay. So the whole ecosystem, the whole fishery evolves around smelts and moosehead. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have enough smelts, they, do, they will eat a few perch from time to time, but 80 to 90 percent of what salmon and toad eat are smelts. Mm. So if you don't have smelts, you have skinny fish. Okay. So what have been the trends? I mean, you've been doing this since the 70s. Yes. So it's a long time. There must be some mega trends you've noticed. Yes. And what we like to see is trends that we can actually control. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't always happen. No, right. But so in the 70s, the fish were actually kind of small. And that's when we were stocking a lot of fish. We trimmed the stocking rates back. We had some of our best growth in the early to mid 80s. And then the lake trout, the wild lake trout population of Moosehead just exploded mm. in the late 80s, early 90s. And our growth for both species, salmon and toad, crashed. And we've been trying to get out of that hole for a long time. And like I said, in 2008, that's when we really made some radical changes with the lake trout regulations mm -hmm. to try to get ahead of that. And uh, I think we were pretty successful. So the fish are looking really good right now. We've had. We've had some great reports uh, this past summer for lake trout and salmon, and and really the brook trout have responded well too. We've had a number of big brook trout caught. Yeah, it's funny we are so full of wildlife in the state we really take it for granted. Don't realize that you actually do have to manage. Um, yes. You know, and a lot of that has to do with human impacts. What we do um, sometimes needs to be curtailed or improved. Uh, otherwise, we can hurt our own fisheries, our own game management. And so, when you are controlling. Uh, what's happening to this population, a lot of that has to do with how we fish them. Right. And that's regulated. Right. Yeah, these are not, uh, these are not like Ron Popeil ovens where you can just set them and forget them. <laughs> right. <laughs> you set a stocking rate, and usually those stocking rates, they can be in, in, uh, in effect for a long time, but you do need to adjust from time to time based on what you see for fishing, and, and even Mother Nature can throw a curveball at you. We had a, that early, early ice out we had a few years ago in early April, the smelts ran early, and I think uh, the cold weather came in after that, and I think we had high mortality on our smelts. Just a natural event, mm -hmm. but it set us back for salmon and toad growth. During that period where the population really exploded, what, was that, what did you attribute that to? Well, there were a number of, number of things. Um, first of all, we had some pretty high fishing in the, in the late 80s, which I think took the top off the lake trout population. So there's some literature that suggests if you have bigger lake trout, it suppresses some of the smaller ones. And so when we lost our bigger lake trout, I think we had uh, a lot of recruitment of those smaller fish. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was probably one of the things that, had, uh, that played a part of it. We also had uh, water level management, new water level management that was designed to improve lake trout spawning. I think that worked really, really well. <laughs> Maybe too well. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so there were, it's like with fisheries management, it's hard to pin it on one exact thing. Yeah. And, but so there were a couple of things that have probably contributed to it. But I think, like I said now, 
we seem to be in a better place. We've thinned them down quite a bit. We're just standing around talking salmon. Tim Obrey is the chief fisheries biologist for the Moosehead Lake region of Maine. We're on the shoreline of the lake in Greenville Junction at the boat launch. In front of us, three of Tim's staff are retrieving landlocked salmon. They were trapped just off the beach. In a moment, we'll be taking them out one by one, putting them to sleep, and then measuring the length and weight. The idea is to figure out how to manage the Moosehead Lake fishery to produce the best fish. You want enough fish that people can catch them. You want them big enough that people desire them. And that means making sure you have enough fish, but not too many fish. If you outgrow the food supply, all your fish are small and skinny. One thing I hear a lot while I'm sharing the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee in the Maine Legislature is the idea that maybe we should just stock trophy-sized fish. Well, I'll bring that up in a moment right after this break. You're listening to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. All week, we spend countless hours of airtime worrying about the New England Patriots' defense. But for one hour a week, we get outdoors and have some real fun. Today, we're on the shores of Moosehead Lake. It's a beautiful morning, except a little windy, and the waves are lapping at our feet here on the beach. We have just trapped a whole bunch of landlocked salmon to see how the population of the lake is doing. Tim Obrey is the lead fisheries biologist among the four who are examining these fish. The idea is to have a good sports fishery that gives anglers a chance at fish that aren't just plentiful, but are also good sized. Yeah, during my time in the legislature, especially now that I'm chairing the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee, I've always got people who want us to stock bigger fish, bigger trophy fish. From a management point of view, does that make any sense? Well, you could stock big fish for catching, for catching, um, for put and take purposes, but mm -hmm. in a lake like Moosehead, uh, you would, drop would in be, a be a drop in the bucket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. A lake this big, do you have to stock it? We do. We stock. Uh, we're stocking about five thousand salmon right now. Mm -hmm. But we've got a lot of wild. We've got a lot of wild salmon too. So a lot of people have gathered to watch this. Is this a famous activity? <laughs> um, we get a, we get a few people. We get a few people. Yeah. Next week we'll have the high school environmental science class will be over to help us out. So these guys have the the salmon are in the buckets here. They're mm -hmm. going to put them to sleep so we can handle them and not hurt them. And uh, then they're going to get lengths, weights, and ages on the fish. And then they're going to release them, and then within five minutes, ten minutes, they're going to all recover and swim off. So how are they going to put them to sleep? Uh, we've got some fish anesthesia, okay. basically. Mm -hmm. And what is it? It's what? called uh, MS-222. Mm -hmm. I was up at uh, Churchill Dam last summer when they were t uh, checking some of the weirs of the dams up there. Yeah. Uh, and they were doing the same thing. They were putting them to sleep. Yeah. So what is the chemical? It's a combination of chemicals? That this one is just, uh, I'm not, I, I just know it's uh, MS-222 and mm -hmm. uh, it's a powder that we use after the fishing season's closed. And when the fishing season's open, we have another clove oil derivative that we use mm -hmm. for anesthesia. Before we got here, you were saying that some of the fish wise up to this? <laughs> yeah. Do you find evidence of that and how would you know? Well, so when we do, a, it's not so much a problem here. This lake is big enough that once you release the fish, they can mill around. But when we do our smaller trout ponds, mm -hmm. we put a clip, we, we always put a clip on the tail of the fish so we know if we get recaptures. You can actually do a population estimate based on the number of recaptures you get. Mm -hmm. But what you find is after a week or two of trap netting, the total catch just drops right off, even the recaptures. So the fish are getting net smart mm -hmm. at that point. Now for big game management in this day, you can keep track of populations by uh, hunter harvesting success. You know, we track how many bear, how many deer, how many moose are taken. Yep. We don't track how many fish are taken, do we? We do. Huh. Yep. So in the summer, especially in the summer, well, summertime and wintertime, we'll have, uh, we'll contract with a pilot. In recent years, it's been the warden service pilots, and they'll fly over the lake a number of times a day and count the people that are fishing. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have a clerk that's roaming around the lake talking to fishermen and getting information on catch. So what we do is we take those counts that the warden gives us, and we can estimate the number of people fishing the lake, and we take the catch rate information from our clerk on the ground, and we can put those two together to come up with a harvest estimate. Okay. Yeah. Clever. 
Oh, they've been awesome. And not very intrusive either. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can imagine the feedback if you had to make everybody register their fish. No, no it wouldn't go over too well. <laughs> <laughs> what would be considered a trophy size salmon? I think most people consider a four pound salmon a pretty good <laughs> mm-hmm. salmon. <laughs> We don't see too many, we haven't seen too many of those on Moosehead recently because the growth has been slow, but we do see, we still see a number of trophy brook trout mm-hmm. every winter, four to six pound brook trout. What are the most famous salmon fishing lakes in Maine? Moosehead, Sebago, Rangeley, Rangeley. Uh, <coughs> West Grand, mm. Fish River Chain is very good fishing. What's it take for a lake to be a good salmon lake? Because not all of our lakes are. Well, you got to have smelts. Yeah. You got to have the food for them. That's the big thing. Generally, a, you know, bigger lakes with lots of smelts. We had a bill in the legislature this last year that would have extended uh, a fly fishing season, uh, and it got voted down in the committee because we were afraid of trampling on salmon eggs. Right. Big concern. It, it is. Fall fishing is a big concern. Yeah. These fish are very vulnerable that time of year mm-hmm. and uh, it's a critical period for them. They're spawning, they need to do their, they need to be able to do their thing. And when We've done our radio telemetry work on brook trout on Sarkadian Stream and Moose, on uh, Roach River and up on Chamberlain. We found that over half the males die just from natural causes after mm-hmm. spawning. So to add any kind of additional stress on them during the spawning season could really mm-hmm. be detrimental. And this certainly isn't like the Pacific Coast salmon uh, that come in from the ocean and go upstream and die. Right. These no. can uh, reproduce over and over. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So what's their biggest predator? Otters? Um, Just guessing. Well, it's probably humans, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm good with that. Yeah. In the fall, when these fish are up in the brooks and streams, the uh, the otters will get at them, the eagles and ospreys get at them, great blue herons mm-hmm. get a lot of trout in the fall. They stand in the shallow areas when the brooks, are on these brooks and uh, the fish swim up by them and they, we've seen a lot of fish with holes poked right in the back of the head from great blue heron. So you put them to sleep, you yep. weigh them, you measure their length, you clip their tails, anything else you're doing to them? They're looking at uh, they're looking at the fish for clips mm-hmm. that we put on in the hatchery so we can tell how old the fish is. Yeah. So let's see. That fish is an RV. So that is a two plus two year old fish. Okay. So I think I'm not sure. That fish looked like it was about 16, 16 and a half inches long. I think mm-hmm. we'd like to see those fish about sixteen. So that's a good that's a good fish. That's a good fish. Okay. Yeah. Now you put them to sleep, as soon as you've done all these measurements, they're going back in the water. Yep. Do you let them wake up first or do they, <laughs> they sleep it off in the lake? No, they'll wake, they'll wake, they'll put them in that bucket right there. Sometimes we can just leave them in the, in the gravel right there, but if you get a lot of seagulls around, mm-hmm. they're vulnerable to predation, so we'll, we'll recover them, we'll make sure they're awake, and then send them out okay. that way. I wonder what's going through the fish's mind as he wakes up. <laughs> <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> The department is so dependent on various funding sources. What funds this? Is it uh, some federal dollars that fund this as well? Yes, yeah, so we get a lot of federal dollars, yeah. and we use uh, we get a portion of our take a portion of our state money for, comes from license sales, and we can match that with federal dollars. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I forget the name of it. It's the equivalent of Pittman Robertson yeah. money. It's uh, Dingle Johnson. Dingle Johnson. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So essentially, sportsmen have are basically funding this through uh, an excise on their equipment. On their equipment, equipment yeah. correct. Yeah. What was that one, Jeff? Four? BV, yeah. BVs are fours? No, BVs are threes. Three. Three's are threes. Oh, I'm off. They're going to look better than I thought they were. Five, twelve at three. So that's yeah. 20. Like 12, 60 is almost. What, one. almost Twenty and a half inches at three years old. That's outstanding. Wow. Which is an indication that the population is doing pretty well. You have about the right balance. Yes, the growth is very good. Mm-hmm. So I think I, I think we have an objective in our management plan to have those three-year-old fish at around 18 inches. Mm-hmm. So that one's over 20. Yep. But we'll have to. We'll, that's one fish. We need to get a sample. Yeah, yeah, right. you know? <laughs> We're doing well. These fish are exceeding expectations. 
Most of these salmon are about three years old, and some are as big as we might expect to have an older salmon. That means we're getting the balance right in Moosehead Lake. There's enough big fish to catch, but not so many that they're eating all the food fish. Now, if we're currently doing things right, what are the kinds of things we could do wrong that would harm this fishery? Of course, bucket biologists putting invasive fish in here could be devastating. But what else? Well, I'm getting the answers out of Tim Obrey, the chief regional fishery biologist in the Moosehead region. We're at the wharf in Greenville Junction, examining salmon that have been wandering into traps here set two days ago. Back in a moment, this is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. While all other radio shows are safely broadcasting from a studio somewhere, this show is standing at the boat ramp on Moosehead Lake here in Greenville Junction. I'm with Tim Obrey, regional fisheries biologist for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Since the 1970s, IFNW has been trapping landlocked salmon here on Moosehead Lake, watching for trends that indicate whether we've got a great sport fishery or we've got a problem. We don't just want a lot of fish, we want big fish. So far, today's trapping says we're doing okay. So what can we do to screw this up? <laughs> we can uh, have too many tow. Too many tow, mm -hmm. too many salmon. Uh, too much competition for the smelt. We can overfish, we can underfish. Right. All those things. Yeah. You need to look at them every year. And in fact, I mean, it is possible to underfish. You can have too many fish and, and not enough growth. That is a huge problem in a place like Chisuncook. Yeah. We, were, we've got a, we had a trophy salmon fishery there. and. It's an interesting story. We, we put on some restrictive regulations up there in the 90s to try to protect those trophy fish. And a few years later, everything in Millinock is shut down. Mm. So all those thousands of people that used to go up there to fish left. Mm. And now we have too many fish and not enough food up there. So we're gonna, we have a, it's a similar situation to what we had on Moosehead a few years ago. We have too many fish and we gotta do something up there to thin them down. Mm. But that, that's a real problem. You can have too many fish, if, and you, you have to be careful with your regulations. If you get too restrictive, you can either reduce the harvest or you can basically discourage people from coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wildlife management is much trickier than most people would understand. We do the same thing. We monitor constantly on bear population, deer population, moose. Um, we get into that whole bear debate not realizing we're really getting to the point where we have too many bears. Yeah. And it has to be managed somehow. Uh, Mother Nature will do it, but not in a pretty way. It's much uglier when Mother Nature does it. Well, we don't get too many other fish. We get a few suckers. Yeah. But uh, there aren't a lot of trout hanging around right here. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly mostly salmon. If we wanted to get trout, we'd go up to the mouth of the Roach River mm -hmm. and uh, put a net there. Or the weir. We've had our weir up there. It's, that was very, uh, very successful. Mm -hmm. And the big reason that these salmon are coming to this spot is because that's where they were released. That's right. Okay. They're looking for a big black hose to crawl up in, <laughs> back into a truck. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> Let me see if I get the natural history right. Uh, 10,000 years ago, we were under a mile of ice right here. Uh, when that finally, that depressed the earth, so uh, the elevation was essentially lower because of all that weight. When that melted, the ocean flooded the area, so ocean salmon uh, would have been in this area. As the land rebounds, uh, and some of these lakes get cut off, the salmon get stuck there and they evolved to be freshwater fish. In a handful of places. In a handful of Moosehead places. was not one of them. The salmon are not native here. Mm. They were re, uh, they were introduced here in the late 1800s, but just south of here in Sebec, mm -hmm. they, they, did, uh, they did survive there, and that is a native population. So what's the essential difference between an Atlantic salmon and a landlocked salmon? Do you know? Well, just the fact that these the landlocks never could get back to the ocean. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. But they're now separate species, so there must be some distinct differences and different adaptations. And then over a short period of time, because 10,000 years is not a long time for it. Seems like it to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, your fisheries biologists here are busy working on salmon at the moment, but uh, other parts of the summer they're working on other fisheries. So in the Moosehead area, what are you managing mostly? Brook trout, salmon, what? Brook trout, salmon, tog take up mm -hmm. the vast majority of our time. Mm -hmm. Don't yes. spend a lot of time on bass or pickerel. Or <laughs> Not too much. We have some nice bass waters in the southern part of the region on Sebec, mm -hmm. Sebec, Hollow Manhannock Ponds, Brands Mill. Those are in this region, and, th uh, and that's fine down there. But up here, this is not really bass country. Yeah, they're an invasive up here, so we have no size of bag limit. We don't we don't spend any time managing them up here. Mm -hmm. 
We're what? fortunate to have all, we have a lot, large number of wild native brook trout ponds up here, yeah, so we yeah. spend a lot of time on that. How long was that one, Jeff? 466, that's good. Yeah. So that's just, that's over 18, that's a three-year-old. If somebody catches the fish with a clipped fin, are they supposed to tell anybody or? No, no that's just mainly for our purposes. Mm -hmm. That way we can look at the fish and just t know what the age is. If we were dealing with wild fish or fish that were not clipped, we'd have to take a scale sample off the fish. And you look at the scale under a microscope and it has rings like a tree. Mm -hmm. And you can tell the age of the fish that way. So you can see that fish that Jeff has right there. It's got kind of a bronzy color on it. And it's got the hook jaw, the kipe, so that's a male. Mm -hmm. And then the females, you'll see a female come up. It'll be, you'll see the, be able to see the egg sac is mm -hmm. there. It's all swollen and then the vent is protruding where the eggs come out. Just at the right time. On our grounds, is there any competition? They oh, fight over the women? Uh, oh yes, yes, that's why there's such a high mortality on yeah. salmon and trout. They, mm -hmm. they head up in these streams in September, October, and they, it's nothing but a fight for the next yeah. month and a half. <laughs> You'd think the bigger ones would win that fight. They usually do. Yeah. <laughs> so how many estimate, uh, how many fish do you estimate we just trapped here? I would say they got 25 or so. Yeah, I was thinking in excess of 20, maybe not 30. Now, is that a good morning? That's a good morning, yep. Mm -hmm. We like to, we'll do this till the end of the month, till the weather chases us out and the fish catch goes down. But we like to get, like I said, if we can get 50 to 100 fish, we're doing all right. Mm -hmm. this, we've had some warm weather this this fall. It's kind of slowed things down. Yeah. Right, I think. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. They're, they're still groggy. <laughs> Did they come too, will they? Or? Why, you want one? <laughs> you waiting for us to leave? <laughs> well, I should, if I'd have known, I brought my fish pole. <laughs> <laughs> or a spear. Yeah. A spear? But most generally they'll revive. And yeah, it takes like five, ten minutes for them. Those probably were some of the last fish to go under. So, we, we usually hang out and make sure the seagulls don't come in. All the gulls right here right now are ringbill gulls, which are our smaller ones. So do they also take a fish if they get they a They don't seem to bother them too bad. It's the herring gulls and the blackbacks you worry about. Yeah, the herring gulls are around sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. The loon comes in when he sees us too. It's amazing how <laughs> they get acclimated to people in the... I have a number of people tell me about stories of loons coming right up to the boat while people are trout fishing somewhere and they'll try to get the trout off their line. <laughs> so you can see they're coming back up, yeah. they're swimming off there. So there's a reasonably big salmon, uh, three those, pounds anyway. I think those were all between 16 and 21, yep, so okay. probably two, two and a half, two and three quarters was probably the heaviest. I'm always surprised at how big a fish a loon can take and how big a fish a heron can swallow, for instance. Could they swallow one that big? Have you ever seen it? I've not seen a loon take anything yeah. that big. That that's would be a, big. that'd be a mouthful. Take him a while to catch it. Yeah, what size are they safer from predators? You know, they have to grow to a certain size and then uh, they're really too big for a lot of their predators to handle. Yeah, once they get up over 14, mm -hmm. it's, it's tough for them. Although, the, not to say the predators don't try. Yeah. I mean, they'll, you'll, we'll see 16 inch trout with a hole in the back of their head <laughs> from a, from a uh, heron or mm -hmm. I guess an eagle, an eagle and osprey could probably still they would do latch it. hold of one of those. Yeah, they could do it. There were three uh, salmon just sitting there in the bottom, belly up, still groggy, but one of them has now come to worst hangover ever. <laughs> <laughs> He'll have some stories to tell. Yeah, really. <laughs> you won't believe what happened to me today. <laughs> Alien abduction. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay until that rectal probe. <laughs> hey, Tim, you looking at the same time Friday? Yes. Yep. Friday and then again Monday. 9.45 on Monday. We're going to have the uh, Miss Tardiff's environmental science classes coming over on Monday. So I'm sitting here, or not really standing here, Lakeside, Greenville Junction, asking myself, okay, what did I learn from this? <laughs> I learned... There's a lot of science to how we manage all of our wildlife resources in the state. Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has the job. Uh, sportsmen, as usual, are paying for it one way or another. Correct. Federal excise taxes and our own license fees and stuff. Correct. 
Um, this just doesn't manage itself. We, we spend a lot of time on, especially on Moosehead, but on all our lakes. I mean, we're out here. The only time we're not in the field, really, is December. Mm. We'll be out, we'll be trap netting through November, and then once the ice rolls in in January, we'll be out checking ice fishermen, and we're doing work on smelts in April. Mm. So, I mean, it's 11 months out of the year. In December, we're busy crunching the numbers, mm. analyzing all the data that we've collected over the past year. So. And it does look like you're getting the toad population more under control, yes. just judging by the size of these salmon. How long do you expect to keep doing the toad fishing derby in Moosehead Lake? I think that the derby's here to stay. It's a great yeah, event. That's what I understand. So, yeah, we'll keep that and keep that going. And uh, we've cut back on the regulations a little bit. It's not no. It's, we've gone to a five fish limit instead of the no size of bag. Mm -hmm. um, and like I explained with the harvest estimates, we're watching every summer, every winter to find out how many fish come out, and we'll tweak the regulations and stocking rates as we need to to make sure everything stays good. Well, I certainly appreciate you inviting me today. Glad to have you up, Bob. And with that, we'll go from one lake to another. Tim Obrey has been my guest. He's Chief Regional Fisheries Biologist for the Moosehead area, and that region extends all the way up into the Allagash, which is where we're heading next. As Tim was saying, some of the biggest brook trout in Maine are in Chamberlain Lake. We'll make a return there in a moment and meet up with Rob Flewelling to get the inside story of one of the most famous sporting camps in Maine, Nugent's Camps. Stand by. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket with Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. In 1936, Nugent's Camps was founded on the shores of Chamberlain Lake when the founders basically squatted on state land and started building their dream. The state complained, of course, but it was eventually ironed out, and Nugent's Camps soon became one of the most famous sporting camps in Maine. It's still on state land, the only buildings allowed on Chamberlain Lake here on the headwaters of the Allagash. It's more famous for fishing than hunting, and it's really famous for ice fishing, because there probably isn't a better place in Maine to do it than right here. Rob Flewelling and his wife Stella operate it now, and I'm standing right here in the bluff with Rob, looking down at the lake. It's a lot of history here. Uh, let's let's just briefly go back to the Nugents who founded this place. This uh, there's a sign over there that says it was founded in 1936. It was, yeah, yeah. Alan Patty, they built the raft, a 40 by 50 raft, down at down in the, on the Telos Lake, mm -hmm. down where the uh, the landing used to be before the Chamberlain Bridge was installed. And uh, they rafted up here, mostly at night, using a small motor on the raft, and and uh, found this spot, <laughs> and uh, basically just just moved in and started building yeah. cabins on it. Yeah. You could do that back in 1936. You, you could, yeah, you couldn't get away with doing it nowadays. No. I mean, this is before World War II. Yeah, yeah, it was all lumber company at the time. Yeah, and uh, they, I guess, they had a lawyer that was a friend of theirs that told him that they would he would take care of them if they mm -hmm. did it so yep. and evidently it worked out for them you know we have a lot of sporting camps not nearly as many as we used to but we have a lot of sporting camps in the main woods and when you start to visit them you realize they're all different they're all unique they all offer something special that no other camp does uh this is my first time in nugent's which i'm ashamed to admit because i wanted <laughs> to do this for years yeah <laughs> yeah they have they all have their own history to them yeah the history on this one is primarily it's more fishing than hunting. It is nowadays. Uh, Al used to do a lot of guiding um, for hunting, and John Richardson did too. Um, but since there's no road access, uh, people they found it hard to 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 boat in during October and November. Yeah. You know, they most people want to be you know with their vehicles in the morning, you know, and hunt right until dark, and it, it makes it hard to come across the lake that time of night. There are very few sporting camps left in Maine that you can't drive into. Right. This is one. Yeah, we're one of the few. Penobscot Lake Lodge I've been to by boat. and that's You have, yeah. yeah. And uh, are there any others that come to the top of your head? Um, there isn't. No. Um, Jal Bears is the only other one on the waterway, and I believe you can drive into that, to those camps. Mm-hmm. Yep, so it's unique. you got to get here by boat or plane. You do, yeah. Now, this is on the Delorme's map, a seaplane sea uh, sea base. Uh, sea but does anyone fly in much anymore? Um, not not much anymore. <laughs> uh, two weeks ago, we did have a um, a party that was staying here, and and 
one of the ladies, her brother flew in for the day, yeah. stayed the night, and then went out in the morning. Um, there's probably about a half a dozen planes all fly in throughout the season, but that's about it. Yeah. So we're standing outside your office right now. You got a little garden going on here, which, which I presume which, is that yours or Stella's? Yeah. Uh, well, it was ours. We uh, we didn't have much luck with it this year. <laughs> We've been adding a little bit more to it every year because up here there's not much. You know, there's no yeah. no nice you know dirt or, or loam for it so <laughs> right. we've been bringing in you know soil by bag and yeah and uh, it just it really hasn't done all that great well it's not protected from deer you don't have a deer <laughs> problem or what um we don't yeah. uh a couple of years before we moved up we had two bad winters in a row and it, it pretty much decimated the herd it's it's getting better there's mm -hmm. a few more deer around now than there was when we moved up um but there's, there's not as many as there used to be. I walked down your snowmobile trail yesterday and all the way to the game camera. <laughs> you did, yeah. So if <laughs> no hi. deer shows up there, what does show up in that game camera? Um, that game camera, you'll find mostly uh, coyote and bear. Yeah. Um, we have we have fisher and uh, like turkey buzzards, and we've mm -hmm. had an eagle on it before. We've had two two main lynx on it. Um, raccoons, you know, once in a while a moose will stroll through. Mm -hmm. Um, on, on that particular one anyway. Yeah. So there's a period of time where the dock has to come out <laughs> before it ices it, over. It is, yeah. So that's, is that a big day for you? It's like um, dock out day? It, it can be. Yeah. Um, I've, been, I've been lucky the last two years because I've had the waterway tractor in here. It's a, a, a nice John Deere and it, I've been actually digging new outhouse holes and, mm -hmm. and, and doing a few other projects with it. But I, I was able to lift the docks right up out of the water and, and stack them up, which works nice for us in the wintertime because then the snowmobiles have uh, space to go down through, you know, one mm -hmm. of the trails to get onto the lake. Um, in the past, I've just used the ranger and, and winched them up. Yeah. Um, and I got to try to find a, a little better way of doing that <laughs> if I don't have a tractor in here. Eventually, we'll have one in here, but it's uh just one of the just one of those just things just one of those things yeah. <laughs> a little bit at a time because yeah. when you own a sporting camp in the woods everything costs money <laughs> it, it does yeah <laughs> gotta have a little patience there yeah i'm standing outside the main lodge of nugent's camps with rob flewelling he and his wife stella operate these camps which were started in 1936 by al and patty nugent and now that i've spent a couple nights here i can attest to how cozy the cabins are and how much fun the lake is it's quiet today, but when the snow flies and the lake freezes, it'll get a lot busier. If it crosses your mind to try it out, keep listening for what is coming up next. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Main on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Welcome back to Bob Duchesne's Wild Main. We're at Nugent's Camps on Chamberlain Lake. Rob Flewelling operates these camps at the headwaters of the Allagash, along with his wife, Stella. They're busiest when the fishing is best you remember that earlier in today's show, the regional fisheries biologist said that Chamberlain Lake is one of the best brook trout lakes in the entire state. So your busy season has to revolve around fishing, which includes ice fishing and the It, it the does. We're, uh, we're about as busy as we can be during the wintertime, um, January 1st, right through the, through the end of March. And basically all the cabins are in it every weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we have, we have about a month of uh, downtime for ice you know, when the season ends and ice goes out, you know, before spring, uh, bring, spring fishing starts. Um, and we do have people that will break ice to get in here. Is that right? We yeah. do, yeah. They, they're, pretty, <laughs> they're pretty excited to get in here. And, and then it's about as busy as we can be again for until about the 4th of July. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're not full every weekend. Uh, May is and most of June is, but uh, we'll have a little space here and there. But it's... It's very busy for, for two people to do. Yeah, you know, I would think so. A, it's quite I a think, you know, every now and then I just want to reach out, grab Maine by the collar and bitch slap him. Right. And say, come on. <laughs> right. You know what it's like up here in the summer when it's actually quiet? Right. <laughs> you can go to Bar Harbor and see thousands of people, or you can come up in the Maine woods where there's really nobody here in midsummer. Right. right. Yeah, the fish, the fish have gone down yeah. into deeper water, and a lot of people don't like spending the time to do that. But mm -hmm. if you learn how to do it, it's, it the fishing can be really good during yeah. the middle of summer. But if you're into boating, kayaking, uh, even just sightseeing, wildlife watching, yeah. you could come to Nugent's in midsummer, have yourself a fantastic vacation, and not be bothered by anybody. You sure can. Yeah. 
So logistically, you have to get a lot of firewood in here. You have to get a lot of propane in here. You do. That, that, when do you bring the propane in and how? Um, we try to stock up as much as we can in the wintertime because that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. We have a couple big tote sleds that you can haul the tanks out and they fill them right off a bulk tank right in the parking lot out back. Yeah. Um, and then and during, the winter, during the summertime, I have to put them in the boat. And uh, it's, it's not as much of a job as you would think. Mm -hmm. um, it, it takes about a day to, we usually do about 20 tanks at a time. So it takes three trips to get them all in. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's doable. Mm -hmm. um, the diesel fuel is the same way. Yeah. Um, we're trying to, with the new solar system we're, we're putting in, we're hoping to cut down on that quite a bit. One um, thing I would observe is you have maybe the quietest generator of any sporting camp I've ever been to. Yeah, yeah. The we're using the uh, Honda 6500 EU right now, yeah. and that's that's a great generator. It's a little smaller than what we normally use. We had trouble with our diesel, so I took that to town to have mm -hmm. that worked on. Um, but with the new solar system that we're putting in, we don't really need the the amount of power that the diesel generated. So we may end up sticking with this the smaller one mm -hmm. if. Uh, you know, if the fuel fuel usage is down enough so that it, that it makes sense for us, I might just stick with that. Yeah, and at this point, are any of the cabins really using any electricity? No, none no, of the cabins so. do, except for our house, mm -hmm. um, my workshop, and then the lodge, um, which this time of year, we don't do a lot of the meal plans through the lodge. Um, May and June are usually the biggest, mm -hmm. the biggest times of year when we do that. So who does the cooking, you or Stella, or both? Um, we both do. She yeah. does the majority of it. I, I do mainly the breakfast, mm -hmm. and then uh, she does most of the, the rest of it. Yeah. I, I help out as much as I can, but um, she's definitely the, the heavy lifter <laughs> on that. I have never had a bad <laughs> meal in the woods. In fact, <laughs> no. I, I want to do a radio show on the best food in the woods. Yeah. So how good are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been told we're pretty good, yeah, right. um, but of course, I'm, I'm sure people would say that anyway if, yeah. they, if they want to keep eating, I guess. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. Anyone yeah. who complains has to do the dishes. Right, right. <laughs> Speaking um, of doing dishes, you don't have a dishwasher over there or anything. So. We don't. So no, it's all by it's hand. It's all by hand. It is, yeah. Oh. Do, yeah. During the height of the busy season, do you have to hire on anybody else to do the help? Or um, we just... haven't yet. Um, it may come to a time when we have to do that. Um, Tom Thornton, the, the guy that we started working for up here originally, um, he, his family ran um, the restaurant in Milford yeah, right. mm -hmm. and uh, the Pines. And uh, so he wanted to make sure we put on a pretty good feed when, you know, when he, when he started taking Nugent's over. He wanted to make sure people went away feeling full, you know, yeah, and, right. <laughs> and most people do. Yeah. It's almost too much food, I, I think, sometimes. <laughs> you know, for mo peop most people don't eat like that anymore. You yeah, know? yeah. It's, it's a lot, people are pretty health conscious now, so they, they don't eat like that as much as they used to. Yeah. So what do you have for cabins? Well, we've got seven cabins here on the main site that can fit anywhere from one to eight people. Um, three of the bigger cabins have four-person minimums. Um, we have the farmhouse up the lake. It's about three and a half miles up, and that will feed. That will sleep up to 18 people mm -hmm. uh, with an eight-person minimum up there. Um, that's got to be a lot of extra work to have an outbuilding like that. That's that it big is. up the lake, and you got to eventually look. It know, is. Watch over it. It <laughs> is the. Uh, this, during open water season, it doesn't get rented a whole lot, but uh, in the in the winter time, it's rented every weekend oh, and yeah. a lot during the week. You know, so that does create a. A little bit more work to, to take care of because we try to go through every cabin you know you know vacuum the floors and, mm -hmm. and wash everything down and and uh, make sure it's the same for everybody that comes through yeah. so if you leave it leave it to people just to clean it on their own um, you don't get the same product every mm -hmm. time yeah well is there something that's everybody should know about Nugent's that a lot of people wouldn't know you know anything particularly special anything that makes this um, unique compared the, to all of the sporting camps. Well, the sunsets here are about as good as you can get, oh, I think. Oh, man, are you right about that? Yeah. That was spectacular the last two nights. Yeah. My wife has taken thousands of pictures yeah. of them, and they're all different. And she always says that the camera doesn't do it justice because you have to see it in person. Yeah. Well, when Al and Patty Nugent picked this spot, they really did pick a good spot. <laughs> you got the prevailing wind, which must, from a direct north, it must blow by here and not bother you too much. 
Um, you would think so, yeah, but it, it does it does it does come into the shore. Yeah. Um, Northwest breeze, certainly. North, Northwest really does. Yeah. This is basically the the best place I've ever been to during the summertime for bugs. You know, as far as there's usually a breeze here, keeping yeah. the keep the bugs at at bay. Um, I came the, in here what two mornings ago. I have not seen a mosquito. No. The entire time I've been here. Yeah, I try to keep the lawn down. You know, cut pretty short so yeah. that because uh, we've had a pretty dry season too, which will will yeah. cut down on that. But uh, the mingies will usually come out in the evening. You know, but you gotta deal with those but yeah. um it's it's a pretty good place to be if you walk past the wood line you'll pay for it <laughs> but <laughs> it's uh it's a pretty nice place to be once again that pretty nice place to be is nugent's camps on chamberlain lake rob fluelling has been explaining it he and stella invite you to try it and so do i this has been Bob Deshane's Wild Maine, brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Napa Auto Parts, Bar Harbor Whale Watch, and EBS on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. Thanks for listening.